is no cryptocy almost 70 percent after the stent has been removed and especially for strictures of more than seven centimeters from the recent studies and again in our case it's even more than that as you would know it's more than 10 centimeters and uh, in few trials uh, it has been shown a metallic stems have a bit of an advantage over the plastic stems in view of a low migration rate and the chances of uh, less re-intervention but overall say it if it's a metal or a plastic stent still the stent migration rate is 30 percent i think in uh, in our case the stent has migrated twice one with uh, the biodegradable another one with the metal stent so um, moving on to the BD biodegradable stents, these are the effects is usually temporary. In the larger studies so far, uh, what they have uh, shown is a sequential placement of uh, like three stents, one after the other, had showed uh, increasing relief of dysphagia a period of 90, 55, 106 days respectively. So which means like within three months, I think the effect is gone. And uh, no patients were dysphagia free at the end of their trial. So uh, clearly this is not a long-term solution for these kind of uh, strictures. So the evidence is low and the recommendation is weak. And this is just to show the pictures which we used in, uh, in our case. The first one, uh, the blue one is the biodegradable stent, which is uh, made up of polydiaxinone and it has got 55% of the crystalline structure. So it gets absorbed by uh, 90 days and it works. Uh, how it works is there is a breakdown of this stent by the hydrolysis procedure. And uh, other type available um, stents in the market is made up of polyglycolic acid and polylactic acid. The, but the problem with other two is the, the rate of degradation is much more faster than polydeoxinone. And uh, this stent is uh, the ball stent, which you see uh, the next one, the stent one, which is uh, from the Boston Scientific. So this is uh, one of the, I mean, this is our experience from James Cook, where uh, it was a UK-based multi-center randomized control trial where the patients were recruited from March 2011 to June 2013 with the age group, the cohort being between 18 and 85 uh, years, patients with benign esophageal strictures, uh, and they were followed up at three, six, and 12 months. It wasn't a big cohort numbers, if you, as you could see, it's only uh, 17 uh, numbers. From this uh, thing, what we could uh, see is both the groups improved with the dysphagia rate, but the dysphagia scores uh, for the patients who have the stentings were high at the end of six months uh, with a p-value of 0 0.029, which is significant. But what happened in those situations is the lumen of the esophagus still was patent, but the patients were complaining of dysphagia, maybe due to uh, uh, I mean like the soma somatostatic sensitivity from the esophagus where the stent got absorbed. So that gave the patients uh, some kind of a foreign body sensation, and uh, that could be the reason for ongoing dysphagia, but still they were able to uh, maintain the lumen and to uh, eat and drink. So uh, as you would see from uh, what uh, Elizabeth showed the pictures, you could have seen some kind of a clips, what Prof has uh, done, which was to uh, purely to prune the stent from getting migrated. Uh, the, these are the latest one, which is called as the Ovisco clip. And you can even use the endo clips. And the one on the right-hand side is the Apollo suture uh, techniques. But you, you, as you would see from this, this case scenario, whatever you do, would still the stents get migrated. And uh, for failed structure resolution, so what, what I mean, finally, when you have your tried endoscopic dilatation, where you have tried stents, you have your tried uh, other therapies, in spite of that, if still the stricture persists, like in, like in our cases, so there is something called a self-dilatation, which, uh, which is so far shown safe and effective, but the thing is you need a well-educated and a cooperative patients, and it is suggested only for the proximal strictures, and again, the evidence is very low and recommendation is weak. So um, in spite of all the interventions, um, like more than uh, nine sittings in our patients, now we have come to a stage where we need to do something for a long-term plan for this patient. So my, the question is, whether are we going to do a PEC tube for him for a feeding purpose? Or uh, maybe from the panelists, they were querying regarding a feeding gegenostomy? Or another scenario, whether are we going to do offer the patient an esophagectomy? Whatever the surgical intervention is going to be, the recommendation is again low and uh, the evidence is low. We don't have much at the moment. So uh, that's about the British BSG guidelines. And just a few slides on European surgical uh, gastroenterological uh, evidences 
if you could see, they don't recommend the use of SEMS as a first-line therapy for these kind of a benign esophageal strictures, and as well as they don't recommend a permanent stent placement. Um, even if you use those kind of a metal stents, and the, the advice period is not more than three months. And if it comes to whether if it's a fully covered or a partially covered stents, they suggest to use a fully covered metallic stents. And uh, as I would say, it's, it's only temporary replacement, which they recommend. And they don't uh, specifically recommend for any kind of an expandable stent, either if it's a metallic or a plastic or a biodegradable. And uh, uh, if you could see the recommendation is strong and with the moderate quality of evidence. So um, again, even from the European guidelines, they suggest a combined approach, uh, like a dilatation combined with the stent or a steroid injection like mitomycin C or triamcin alone. Uh, whatever should so give uh, a better outcome, with, but the recommendation is again weak with a very low quality of evidence. And for the refractory strictures, where which has failed every other previous endoscopic management, according to the European guidelines, they call it as like if it has failed two different uh, separate treatments in the past, they consider for a self dilatation and or as either surgical treatment. And if you could see, the recommendations are again weak with a low quality of evidence. So um, this is it with the current evidences, which is, I mean, even in the literature, I can't, we couldn't find much of the case reports based on NG tube uh, based strictures and what is a long-term plan for these kind of a complex patients. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. I, I, I thank uh, both ALSGBA and IAGS for letting me present this case. Thanks. Over to you, Prof. Now. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, yeah, this is where we are, and uh, the, the, the saga continues, and it's very difficult to uh, provide uh, uh, an evidence-based uh, approach because it's so rare and so complex. Um, and this patient, uh, histology, few histologies, all benign inflammatory and like a peptic bad stricture, whether it's due to prolonged uh, nasogastric uh, uh, placement or pre-existing gastroesophageal reflux problem, uh, uh, which was compounded by the, uh, the post-surgery ITU uh, stormy period along with the NG. It's difficult to say, but uh, so that's where we are. And uh, I, I'm happy to uh, you know, invite uh, 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 commentary and comments from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Vish. Uh, so what is the current status of the patient? He still has uh, two stents in the stomach or one stent in the stomach? He, uh, the, uh, the absorber stent gets absorbed, so it's gone. And, uh, so he has got a fully covered self-expand metallic stent, which is encapsulated <clears throat> by a functioning feeding tube, uh, which is in the stomach. But he is fine, he's, he's independent. So he just drives around and with the NJ tube and he feeds himself in the night and then he drinks fluids, you know, and maintains his weight. Uh, so that's where we are. So how is the nutritional status? Nutrition is fine, so he's, he's keeping his weight steady, and he has put on weight after the discharge, uh, but now his BMI is, uh, is 23, 24, 25, uh, 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 which, about which he's, he's happy. He's not worried about the nutrition patient himself. And what was it when, it was, when he was operated, the BMI? Oh, BMI was probably 1920, uh, and because of colitis XYZ, and then... Uh, Obviously, he was getting a nourish uh, via TPN followed by internal nutrition uh, last one one year or so. Okay. So now, uh, uh, you know, he's out of that. So if I have to treat this patient, uh, first of all, okay, of course, we are dealing with now two pathologies. The first, uh, which the patient came in with ulcerative pancolitis and complications of pancolitis, and for which the normal course of action would be uh, after the first stage of the surgery, you would have gone ahead and done the second stage in which you would do completion proctectomy and pouch surgery, and if necessary, diversion ileostomy. And if the patient can get away without ileostomy, if the nutritional status is good, overall health is good, the disease is not that much in the lower rectum, you may not do the diversion ileostomy, and that would be modified two-stage uh, surgery, IPA. Now. Another pathology added to this patient is the long uh, esophageal stricture, the benign one. Obviously, it would now require uh, surgical treatment as the dilatations and stents have failed. 
but uh, we need to discuss this issue with the patients. We need to take a call based on the patient's condition. And uh, if he is quite settled on the ileostomy part and the rectal disease is not that much, then we should give the priority to the esophagus. So the patient should undergo esophagectomy and gastric conduit and uh, get rid of this uh, long standing stricture and start eating. And maybe six to 12 months later, he should undergo completion proctectomy and uh, pouch surgery. I think it is still a, a long way to go to give him uh, what he came for, the best results of what we can give for the pouch surgery. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Any other comments? Right here. <clears throat> Two things. First of all, uh, regarding the patient, if he's happy as he is happy, so we have to leave him alone. If he's happy with his tubes and beans, that's fine. Otherwise, I would have thought that surgery and within a form of translator should increase the way forward. That's what we should offer. That would be the best for him. And number two, I was very happy because there, you know, the Mike Parker mentioned from because I was training in Hull when the first Kalman started in '97. Uh, Peter Selman was my first, uh, uh, you know, consultant at Chris Weiser. I worked for both of them. So it was very nice and very emotional. Thank you. Offer him THE. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from any other faculty? Not only ourselves. Uh, so, uh, can I come in, Avish? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I would like to come in here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Are we coming to a conclusion that prolonged use of nasogastric tube leads to a esophageal stricture. Is there okay. any evidence in this? Oh, well, uh, uh, yes and no, uh, because it's so rare and uh, I'm not sure how many of us uh, uh, deal with this sort of uh, uh, patients. Myself in the business of esophageal surgery nearly 30 years, uh, I've seen three or four cases. I've done two esophagectomies so far, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in similar scenarios. So I, obviously I can't say in this patient whether NG tube is the whole and sole responsible. But just like going back to my analogy, if you put a Foley's catheter in a patient, same Foley's catheter for three months, I'm sure you know what happens. So I have seen in Bombay, as well as I have heard colleagues, it can cause urethral strictures. So same analogy here, uh, the nasogastric tube of 16 print may, I don't know. So we can't prove it, but uh, uh, I can't blame anything else apart from pre-existing uh, gastroesophageal reflux problem with the NG tube without history of corro corrosive intake. Uh, no, that's my take on it. Uh, I take your point. You, urothelium, is, to... urothelium is a different thelium and no. esophageal mucosa is different. I'm so agree. having 36 years of teaching experience in a public hospital, mm -hmm. I have never seen a rice tube induced corrosive stricture. So I think proper history examination of uh, this patient should have. Obviously, this patient came acute. He had ulcerative colitis with uh, complications related to uh, ulcerative colitis. The Ryle's tube seems to have gone in very smoothly. And then the patient develops a stricture is unable to be understood. That's my take. Thank you. No, no, I agree. I agree. Because there was no history of any of the nutritional problems uh, from dysphagia, injury tube, went in with no issues as far as I know. Uh, so it's difficult. At the end of the day, we, have, we, were, we, we are talking, uh, we haven't had a, a history prior to our endoscopy examination prior to this presentation. I take your point entirely agree. Uh, in fact, when, when now things are to being suggested to esophageal replacement, mm -hmm. a serious thought should be given in treatment of this patient. That's my take. No, no, agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike wants to come. Well, just one little comment. I, I think I remember it correctly, but after his major operation for the colitis, I believe he had a pretty major gastrointestinal bleed. And you just wonder if he didn't ulcerate the esophagus at that time, and that's what caused the bleed. And then the strictures come as a result of that. So maybe it was a Riles tube you know, problem. It does happen occasionally. I, like yourselves, I, I've seen one or two over the years, not many. Um, but it is a, a recognized association, isn't it? I mean, you, you hear these reports from time to time. Yeah. Uh, so it may be. I, I wish you well with your management of him now. And I think the most important person to ask is the patient himself, because he's probably not going to want too much done at the moment for quite a while. Uh, 
but he's young and he might want reconstruction at a later date. Because if you do do that, you've got to remember that if he's going to have pouch surgery, you're going to use the small bowel. And if you're going to um, take part of his esophagus out, you've got to lift something up there and you haven't got any colon there, so it can't be a pull through. Um, just quite a few things to consider, that's all. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Because the farming season is a farmer, so you wish to sort of postpone his sort of decision-making process mm. after Christmas, so that's where we are. Good idea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Parker, with due respect to you, uh, 10 centimeter long stricture because of rice tube is not thing that I can digest. No, no, no. I, I, no it can happen. It can happen. I have seen, but it can happen. Yes. And well, uh, maybe the patient can have uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, which was not diagnosed. And uh, that's a different to... cause. That's a different cause. But we don't have any to prove. The patient about. has to be investigated completely. Because if it is eosinophilic esophagitis leading to stricture, it can also involve the stomach. And if you're going to pull up the stomach in absence of colon, you are going to land this patient into deeper trouble. That is yeah. what I want to say. Yeah. There were no eosinophils seen on the few histologies so far, but but you know I take I take the point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So Vis, I just wanted to make one comment. Uh, we can't leave this patient as it is because he has stent in the stomach, which can lead to obstruction of the small bowel, which is again will be required in future for the pouch surgery, and uh, obviously he has a long stricture. So obviously whenever he accepts that he wants to undergo surgery, he has to undergo surgery. It is going to be a difficult choice, but uh, it cannot be, I mean, we cannot say that, okay, nothing to be done, no. No, 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 I agree. Uh, yeah, that's where I am, so. What's your plan? What's your plan? Once the patient comes around and says the intervention? Well, I, 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 what we did not cover so far is, shall we go back to one year back? and start the process again. I don't know, I may be more successful this time because he was very ill when we started this journey. That's only one thing, but obviously I take all of your comments. So uh, most important is making the diagnosis right and getting, the, uh, getting it uh, from the points of patient mouth and preparing him. And then my plan is to uh, uh, you know, discuss uh, surgical intervention, which we're, because he has got big laparotomy, he's got ileostomy, so it will be sort of challenging. Uh, and uh, as Sunil was saying, we have to extract the stent, untangle this between two, and then prepare the stomach and, and pull it up. So uh, it's not going to be an easy task, but as I said, you know, I, I, we do use a project miss almost every week in the hospital, but we don't do benign. Uh, so I've done maybe five or six over the years. So that's about it for benign like this. But there you go. So thank you very much, everybody. I'll just, uh, you know, close you. this presentation and go to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mr. Nath. And uh, both your trainees did an excellent job. Convey our uh, it's sure, certificate it's sure. of appreciation. Yeah. It's sure. Just uh, Subhas wants to make a comment, please. Yes, uh, yes Subhas can. Uh, I also fully agree with uh, Dr. Aved Albi. This patient needs investigations further. Uh, the first thing is we can't leave him with the stand, which is which may migrate further down and cause further problems for him. So I personally feel that as we do a lot of endoscopy, uh, let's put another metal stand, dilate the esophagus, and through that stand we can take out the stand which is right now there, or we do a laparoscopy gastrotomy and take out the stand first. Further investigate the patient, rule out esophagus. Uh, eosinophilic esophagitis or other causes that before we plan anything, before we go for uh, transhiatal surgery. Uh, uh, that's what uh, I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you, you so much. No, that's, uh, that's already in my mind. I've spoken to him. <laughs> so as I said, that's why I asked, can we re reinvent the cycle again? That means going back to where, where we were. Yeah. Thank you. We have Dr. Pavnila Lal. I would like Thank to you. hear his comments. He's a senior professor of surgery, please. And yeah, so, uh, thank you very much. Very interesting case. And uh, I think all options have already been discussed. Uh, I would say that uh, this was obviously something uh, of something like a peptic uh, stricture, long standing reflux stricture. Uh, haven't uh, heard, read uh, much of, uh, uh, you know, Riles uh, induced uh, long seg segment strictures and why they should then finish only at eight or 10 centimeters and not continue beyond. And uh, I find that there was a lot of inflammation also at that time. So there could be an inflammatory pathology, uh, such as, uh, you know, um, on, on secondary on a 
on a peptic uh, long segment uh, stricture. I think that would be a possibility, but all options have now been discussed. And uh, I think we will uh, wish uh, Prof Vishwanath with all uh, the- All the best. Sources, <laughs> yes, uh, on, at his command. <laughs> he needs a lot of that and we would like to follow up on this case wish. Of course, I will, I will certainly. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for all the faculties for a very interactive uh, session with a very interesting case. It's not our uh, love and regards and appreciation to both your trainees and the certificates will reach them through the mail. Let us move on to the final of the Chris Cross case two to do the presentation we have uh, with us. Along with you, Professor Vishnath, we have Professor Pavanindra Lal, our ECA member from the North Zone. Also, he is a, a very important board in the National Board of Examiner. And also we have our president elect, Professor L.P. Tangabelu. And uh, so we have from the city of Delhi, city of Newcastle and the city of Paimatu, three stalwarts to take uh, Pius Agarwal, who is going to present an interesting case of a Goldstone story. Over to you, Pius. And uh, before that, Pavan Indiral, you could make a comment before we start the session. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Isar Murthy, and a very good evening to all the esteemed uh, members of the ALS, GBI and the IAGS. And uh, this particular case is going to be presented by our resident, uh, Dr. Piyush Agarwal. He passed out his MBBS uh, from Amrita Kochi uh, way back in 2008 and then finished his uh, MS in surgery uh, um, in, uh, from Regional Institute of Medical Sciences, Manipur in 2015 and joined my department as a fellow of minimal access surgery in 2019. And uh, this case we were, uh, we did, uh, uh, in the middle of the, just before the start of the uh, very serious second pandemic wave uh, this year in April 21. And I will leave it to Piyush to uncover this uh, a very interesting gallstone story before all the esteemed uh, faculty members here this evening. Over to Piyush. Piyush, please share your screen and you can start. Uh, thank you, sir. And I would like to thank IAGS and ALG, ASGBI for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So to begin with my case, this is a saga of a gallstone that became nightmare for the patient and the surgeon. And my moderators are Professor Pawaninder Lal, who is a chairman of minimal access surgery at Maulana Azad Medical College, executive director of National Board of Examination in Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and Professor Anil Agrawal, director of GP Pant Hospital, New Delhi. So our patient was a 45 year old lady who had a history of jaundice, pain, abdomen and fever in the month of February 2021 for a, for a duration of one week. On clinical examination, she had mild icterus and per abdomen finding revealed there was a tenderness in the right hypochondrium. There was no lump and no scars over the abdomen. On further investigating, there was a mild increase in leukocyte count of 14,000 and her bilirubin was raised to 6.2 with a direct fraction of 5.6 milligram per deciliter. Alkaline phosphatase was high and 180 international unit. Her USG abdomen revealed cholelithiasis with cholelithiasis, and she, she underwent MRCP scan which showed largely dilated common bile duct with multiple impacted calculi in the lower part along with cholelithiasis. So, as per Tokyo guidelines 2018, our patient is in acute cholangitis. So how should we manage her? Well, uh, so at this point, uh, there was uh, this question in front of us, whether uh, they should go for a primary surgery or for uh, uh, what should be the management at this point of time with multiple stones. Uh, as we have seen, it's uh, the question is open to the panel. Uh, I think you can, yeah. So ERCP uh, is the first thing I would contempt. Yes, I think yes. So that's how it was proceeded. You can go on. So the patient was stabilized, and a straight away ERCP was done, and CBD stenting was done. Following this. She recovered on IV antibiotics and conservative management. So what should be done next for her? 
So yeah, this was the second question. Yeah, what should be the plan now? We have had the stent. She has recovered from her acute sepsis, but she has got very large stones, as you saw in the MRCP, uh, uh, multiple uh, filling defects. So again, to the panel, a uh, few of the options. What would be your choice and why? No, how how large was the stone, Pawan? Uh, multiple be... stones, uh, one centimeter. Uh, you can see the filling defects. Very large, uh, multiple stones there. Uh, at the lower end of the common bile duct, uh, one centimeter, half a centimeter. Uh, so uh, what I'll say, and the patient was in sepsis cholangitis, but the stent was put, was the attempt was made to flush out the stone at the same sitting? No, or no, no, it was, okay. it was not, fam it was not deemed uh, uh, safe. So it was just left for drainage and she was uh, kept on ant IV antibiotics and she recovered from the IV antibiotics. The sepsis settled. The pain and tenderness got, went away and uh, she was uh, up and about in the next uh, seven days after IV antibiotics. Okay. But then she had these all these stones uh, remaining in the CBD. So what would what be... I, what I would do, I will go back again and do the re-ARCP re and do a you know liberal sphincterotomy and flush out the stone because one centimeter of stone can be out by a... A liberal sphincterotomy. So yes, how much how much time gap would you like to give between the first and the second procedure? Four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. Okay. Uh, go on, Piyush. Tell us what happened. Abhay Dalvi wants to come in. Just a minute, Pavan. Okay. Go back. Go back. Yeah. Now there are two things that we have to decide. Number one, in obstetric jaundice with cholangitis, control of sepsis is important, which has been covered by stenting. Number two is there is an obstetric agent which is still there and which has to be removed. Whether by laparoscopic surgery, open surgery or endoscopy is up to when the patient is fit to undergo this uh, procedure. Endoscopy nowadays, according to expertise which is available, uh, spyglass including, I think depending on what is available to you, the choice has to be taken. That's all that I want to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for your input. I mean, the only challenge is that we are dealing with multiple large one centimeter plus size stones. And uh, even with if a liberal sphincterotomy, there could be, uh, you know, uh, challenges in their retrieval if you're not breaking them or they are not crushing very easily. So that was the only thing. But yes, uh, uh, we'll go with the uh, Dr. Sunil's uh, choice of uh, going for a second ERCP. Go on, uh, Piyush. So this lady undergoes a second ERCP. And this time, the operating the gastroenterologist could clear the CBD, and uh, he placed uh, he removed the previous stent and replaced the new stent. Now, what do you so, do now? What, yes. so that's the question. Uh, the CBD has uh, been cleared. We did not get pictures because both these procedures were done at a private setup outside, and uh, uh, we had the first MRCP, but we didn't get the second one. And this was a four-week gap. First one was February. Second one was March, and uh, the stones are out. What's your next plan? Subhash wants to come in. Subhash. Oh, okay. No, the uh, uh, once the stones are out, if the patient is uh, fit and ha not having any jaundice, I think we will go for cholecystectomy, no lab cholecystectomy. But then here, if we do not do an MRCP. Uh, there's a problem. Ultrasound in the presence of stent is very, very poor. It almost invariably misses the stones. So I would prefer doing an MRCP again and a very good ultrasound before going for a, taking a decision for lab cholecystectomy. Over to Piyush. Uh, to uh, let us know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khanna. But uh, my question is, you know, there have been two ERCPs uh, with uh, both procedures being about four weeks apart, so about two months of stents in the common bile duct, and uh, then uh, a sphincterotomy with the extraction of stones. So do you think it's going to be a straightforward cholecystectomy, which anybody can do, or should there be uh, some kind of anticipation uh, yes. for, for the reason that two ERCPs have been done one after the other? I, I, I also mentioned a very good ultrasound. When we say very good ultrasound, means the ultrasound will be able to tell us the thickness of the wall, whether the, how much fibrosis is there, what is the cystic duct length, what is the depth of callous triangle. So a very good ultrasound is mandatory here. 
but the ultrasound might miss the CBG stones also. So a very good ultrasound with a very good MRCP will let me know whether this with cholecystotomy is going to be very, very difficult or not. But uh, uh, it's, it's, expected, it's expected it to be very it, difficult because there are two Can I come? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Sunil, yeah. please come. See, I yeah, know, of course, Dr. Subhas Khanna, uh, you know, being safe, but then do all the ERCP sphincterotomy done, uh, stone cleared. So it's, it will be a difficult cholecystectomy. So we'll call Dr. Pauninella to do the lab coli. <laughs> if they stand there, if they stand there, do a lab coli and remove the stent after three, four weeks after the lab coli. All right. Okay, Piyush, now unravel this further so, story of this patient. Sir has clearly said that this lady has undergone two times ERCP and uh, we should be having some anticipation of difficulty. So uh, some kind of surgical expertise is needed in this case. So see where she should get the surgery done and by whom this question arises. So what is the panel? Actually, uh, in, in UK, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, because gallbladder surgery is, I presume, much more common than uh, in Asia, but uh, um, this sort of uh, surgeries we, uh, um, are done in uh, so-called second as well as tertiary hospitals. Uh, in the absence of so-called meniscus twos and threes, in the absence of uh, um, uh, fistulas uh, elsewhere. But, um, uh, but, but from the point of uh, generality, I think, uh, you know, if I'm a surgeon in a small hospital, I will certainly take two steps back and, and discuss and probably request uh, much more experienced <laughs> upper GA expertise to or HPV expertise to do this operation. Uh, in this patient. So thanks, thanks, uh, Prof. Vish. Uh, very, very important points there. Uh, Piyush, uh, go on further. So this lady underwent a laparoscopic cholecystectomy on a small peripheral setup around 40 kilometers away from the Delhi on 10th of April 2021. All this time she was in Delhi, but for this procedure, she chose to go to her uh, uh, friend's brother, who was a surgeon, and uh, uh, said that this will be a straightforward procedure for a lap coli, so she got operated there. Okay, go on. So, intraoperatively, the relatives of the patient were informed that there is a stent which is seen from the cut end of the cystic duct, and consent was asked for conversion to open surgery, and all the trocars were removed. So, at this point of time, we all know that this is the CBD which has been injured in this patient. So what next should be done in this case well, so, yeah. go back go back go back uh, at least in in, in our country uh, uh, in uk we will uh, um uh, as soon as we know that we have done so called damage without knowing exactly where and what whether it's cbd or chd or right duct or left duct or whatever it is um so we got sort of uh, avenues to, to speak to the so called hpv tertiary center uh, on call surgeon hpv surgeons and then uh, seek their opinion very rare uh, on occasions they do come to the theater where we are and then try to sort of uh, do a definitive procedure uh, to the open method majority of the time um, uh, and if you're in a situation where you know you, you don't have health then obviously you know it's uh, as long as there's no bleeding it's just damage limitation wash out and drain and 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 uh, and get the expertise uh, uh, at the earliest uh, in, uh, opportunity. That's what uh, we do here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Prof. Um, so uh, basically, in this particular case, the surgeon uh, said that uh, there has been uh, some injury to uh, the gallbladder connecting duct, which is the cystic duct, which he's explained to the patient. And uh, he was wanting permission for open surgery. And uh, he said, I'm absolutely fine to go ahead with the uh, further procedure. Uh, so that's what he told the relatives. Uh, go on, Piyush. So what we do when bad things happens to the good people? At this time, the relatives of the patient contacted Professor Lal and a video call was made with the operating surgeon. Operating surgeon at this time was asked to reestablish the pneumoperitoneum and show the findings laparoscopically. So these were the findings laparoscopically shown to us on a video call. Here we can see there is a portion of the gallbladder which is attached with the tubular structures which is cut open and in this video there was endobiliary stent was also seen freely floating in the abdomen. So what should be done now? 
transfer it to Professor Lau's uh, hospital. <laughs> what exactly I said. No, no, no. We, we go back to the picture. What was the picture showing? Uh, so there was a divided tubular structures seen and uh, the gallbladder was seen attached with a portion of the this tubular structure. Right. So we are dealing with a complete CBD transaction. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. So I don't know what Dr. Lal said. When they, if he can, he can't travel there. So the best thing would have been to, you know, put a drain, uh, close it, and send it to his center. Uh, or you know, this patient needs a hepatocystinostomy uh, at the end of mm -hmm. the day. So yeah. So absolutely fine, Dr. Sunil. I you were uh, bullseye. Go on, Piyush. So. Coming to the emergency bile duct injury response, as sir has clearly said, whether to convert into open, continue with the laparoscopy, or refer the patient. So, this patient was advised to refer, the operating surgeon was advised to refer the patient, remove the stent, left the gallbladder in situ, nothing more has to be done, and place a large drain and refer the patient. So, the patient was referred at our center on the same day received in evening at 4 p.m. She was resuscitated, her drain was nil, and on clinical examination, there was a mild tenderness at the surgical site. So what should be done now? Need imaging, need imaging C, C, you know, CT or MR, MR, sky, MR CT, uh, if the patient is stable, to just to get and plan the surgery. Uh, so, or, Obviously, the patient is stable. I would do some imaging before you open but why up. Why was drain nil with a complete transaction? Was it blocked? No, it's probably it was clipped. Yeah, that was uh, that was the apprehension. With uh, there were two of us now uh, at the surgeon, so we got up uh, together as a team. And uh, well, I had the I had no recording of the video, but I was convinced that I had seen on the video call the divided uh, duct. And uh, uh, but uh, the abdomen was not very tender, uh, uh, it was uh, not very distended. The drain was nil, so my colleague surgeon was a little bit skeptical about whether to go in or not. But we were at four o'clock in the evening and we had no uh, resource for further investigations. So, uh, Piyush, unravel the further course. So, the decision was made to re explore her laparoscopically again, and all the ports were re established from the same sites. Two additional 5 mm ports were introduced. A diagnostic laparoscopy revealed around half, half a liter of bile collected in the subdiaphragmatic and subhepatic spaces, and gallbladder was seen attached to the proximal divided portion of the common hepatic duct, which we could see clearly on our diagnostic laparoscopy. So, this is a small video clip of uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. So here we can see the this is the portion of the gallbladder which is attached with a portion of the common hepatic duct and a segment of the bile duct is completely missing in this case. Go on. So the lower end of the CBD was also seen as a child with multiple silk sutures, which uh, I, we, th we thought that the surgeon has tried to suture it, and there was no obvious bleeding from any ends. So, as per Bismuth and Strasbourg classification, we know this is a even type of the injury, and in the Stewart Way classification, this is a class three injury, which is the most common, where the operating surgeon misinterprets the anatomy, thinking that CBD has a cystic duct and divided it completely. So, what next should be done? So now the patient is in a tertiary center with senior surgeons who have got tremendous HPB experience and treating also bile duct injuries. And the bile ductus is already divided, just distal to the cystic duct. So, obviously, patient will require hepatico uh, jejunostomy. And there are surgeons in place, and there is not much time lost between the initial injury and now. And also the CBD was dilated to start with. So I think one should go ahead with the hepatico jejunostomy, particularly in a tertiary center. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. Uh, go on, Piyush. So that was exactly done. We completed the, we continued the surgery laparoscopically. Cholecystectomy was completed. 
common hepatic duct was seen intact. There was a prominent right hepatic artery which was seen behind the common hepatic duct. And then we decided to complete the surgery by doing a laparoscopic RU and Y hepatocogesinostomy. So um, we made a 50 centimeter from the diesel limb and reconstructed with 100 centimeter RU limb, completed the jejunogesinostomy in two layers and uh, hepatocogesinostomy in single layer, retrocolic fashion using a three OPDS in two half, posterior and anterior. And after ensuring the hemostasis, patient was extubated. Now, coming to the post-operative course, this lady remained stable for the next two days. On the third post-operative day, she developed pallor and tachycardia. Her abdomen was mildly distended and her hemoglobin dropped from 10 grams to 6 grams per deciliter. At this point of time, her drain was still nil. So we stabilized her, we transfused her blood and plasma, and then we planned for a CCT abdomen, which which revealed large intraperitoneal collection all over the surface of the liver and we thought this as a hematoma. So we can see in this video there is a drain but still the drain was not working and it was not draining anything since all the bloods were clotted. So what next should be done for her? You have already hinted that right hepatic artery was just behind. So yes, uh, yes. while doing a laparoscopy, a nick or a stitch through the right hepatic artery and uh, possible yes, possible hemorrhage from there. That was one one possibility. Any other or there can be there can be bleeding from mesenteric vessels. No, well, it's okay. Because it could be an it's pseudo aneurysm. Pseudo aneurysm. Reaction because of infection, biliary sepsis, pseudo aneurysm of first yes, damage. It's difficult. No? It is a reactionary hemorrhage. What do we do? We go in open or lap? I think you can go in laparoscopically if the patient is stabilized enough. Uh, you have the team. To me, I think angiographic embolization is the mode of choice followed by laparoscopy and lavage. Yeah, I would I'll... still conjure for some more time because they might stop. Prof. Vishwanath. He was trying uh, to come in. You know, we, we would do a CT angiogram, although you had a CT scan, but there were, I couldn't see any flush in the nice video which was demonstrated. So the uh, uh, CT angiogram with the blood pressure, you know, around 80, 90, you have to just keep the blood pressure going to, to, to see any flush. Um, uh, and, and going back to, you know, it could be any of those two or three uh, differential diagnoses mentioned, but I think uh, the problem in these sort of cases is unless there's an active bleeding, usually you uh, end up in just the delivery of hematoma and flood and wash out. But it's nice to uh, have a bit of arterial uh, anatomy before you jump in. And uh, we usually, you know, get a CT and Joe, if there is a flush, we just embolize before we encounter. But obviously hematoma is so big that it may act as a septic focus that may require some attention. But most important for this patient now is bleeding, uh, so which we need to sort of address it. And then right. the hematoma. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Vishwanath. Uh, go on, Piyush. Unravel the story can further. I, can I comment here? Can I make a yeah, comment? Yeah, Dr. Here? Subhash, please. Uh, I feel before the exploration, although we had seen a complete transac completely transacted uh, CHD common hepatic duct, uh, we still need an MRCP in these patients along with a CT NGO because there's a complete transaction. We are not sure only on laparoscopic about the nature of vascular injury. So before the, I explore this patient for uh, for a bypass, uh, I would uh, I would suggest that we should do an MRCP along with CT NGO. And now also in at this stage we need a CT NGO at present to locate the bleeding. I agree with Professor Vish. Right. So CT NGO uh, had not shown any flush, and the scan pictures we just showed you. So we will go with the uh, flow and uh, uh, see what uh, happens next. Piyush, go on. So we decided to re-explore her at our center laparoscopically on the fourth post-operatively day because we saw there was a lots of large clotted blood inside the peritoneal cavity and that has to be evacuated. So we did a diagnostic laparoscopy which revealed around two liters of clotted blood all over the surface of the liver 
and we looked for the sites of the bleeding, but we did not find over sites of the previous jejunal jejunostomy and hepatico jejunostomy. Those were normal. And in this picture, we can see there are lots of clotted bloods all over the porta. Then we there was an active bleeding seen at the lower end of the CBD near the black silk sutures, which were placed inside the which were put on the first surgery itself in the region behind the hepatico jejunostomy. So with a lot of challenge, we put a figure of eight sutures using proline 4 and bleeding was controlled. And we tried to avoid any injury to the loop of the hepatico jejunostomy and the right hepatic artery, which was prominent and posterior, posteriorly placed. Then we did a thorough peritoneal lavage and multiple drains were placed. Now, this is a small video clip of uh, showing the laparoscopic suturing. Now, this is the hepatico jejunostomy loop. We had to put it away from the sites of the bleeding. And this is the lower end of the CBD from, which, from where there was a small ooze was there. So we could just suture it and the right hepatic artery is just posterior to it. Okay, go on, uh, Piyush, you can move on. So following the second surgery, our patient remained stable for the next two days. Then again, she developed pallor and tachycardia on the third post-operatively day, and there was a mild distension of the abdomen. Then she started developing malina on the post-operatively day three and complaints of passage of clots per rectum. So she was again in shock, and then we stabilized her with blood and plasma, and volume replacement was done. So at this time, of at this time, we are thinking of a GI bleed. Now, we want to know where is the site of the bleeding, what is the etiology, is it hemobilia, and what should be done next for the patient. Yeah, it's open up again to all of you. How was the coagulation profile? Coagulation uh, that was were normal, sir. Normal, sir. Only there was a drop in hemoglobin. And, uh, any endoscopy apart from ERCP, I'm sure when ERCP was done, there were no varices. Yes, sir. not so, done. No varices were reported. Yes. This, this uh, looking at the uh, you know uh, scenario of the patient, it's a hepatico jejunostomy bleed. Say you know coming from there. So I will still if the patient is stable, conserve many anyway, natural history. Two third or you know would stop. Or if they don't stop with the conservation, of course you know angio, CT angio, and therapeutic embolization will be my next option. Okay, yeah, so that's a, that's an important uh, point you made. So basically, patient was just pouring uh, melina and clots from the uh, per rectum and uh, we were and she was uh, not uh, looking well at all. And uh, in the next uh, one day, uh, she showed uh, signs of uh, distension of the abdomen as well. So uh, Piyush, uh, go on further. So as the sir has rightly said, we did an upper GI endoscopy on post-operatively day three which was quite normal. Then we did a CT angio on the post-operatively day three itself, and which showed a large pseudo aneurysm in the region of the right hepatic artery. Now, this is the pseudo aneurysm here. There was no active bleed seen on the CT. So this is a 3D reconstructed image of the CT angio, which is showing a pseudo aneurysm in the branch of the right hepatic artery. So what next should be done for the patient? Well, the embolization uh, now, I think, uh, you know, pseudo aneurysm is all depending on the, the luck of the interventional radiologist uh, when you do the CT angio, isn't it? So this patient has blood significantly. So certainly um, putting some coils um, transfemoral uh, into the appropriate branch uh, um, would certainly would uh, clog this and uh, hopefully you you know you will prevent another bleed. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Vishwanath. Go on, uh, Piyush. So we 
we we went away with the angiography and uh, with keeping in mind the possibility to have some intervention um, on uh, angiography reveals a large right hepatic artery pseudo aneurysm with possibility of rupture into the common hepatic duct or hepatic jejunostomy site making a hepatico making a fistulous connection and that could be the cause of the bleeding so we isolated cannulation of the right hepatic artery was done and it was embolized and this is the video post embolization of the right hepatic artery now this is the left hepatic artery we can see the flow of the contrast but there is no flow in the right hepatic artery further now these are the images before coiling where we can see the large pseudo aneurysm and then after coiling there is no flow of the contrast in the right hepatic artery so i have put this slide to just to show that this lady has undergone total six procedures within a span of 3 months two ercps a month apart then two laparoscopic major surgeries on the same day of 10th of april then again she was re-explored laparoscopically on the 14th or the fourth day of the surgery then a angiographic coiling of the right hepatic artery aneurysm on 19th of april so this all could be possible only in a tertiary care setup not at all possible in any peripheral or a small hospital so post angiography she had a mild elevation of the liver function test which uh, settled in 2 to 3 days she was shifted from icu to room on day 10th and discharged on post operatively day 14th making satisfactory recovery as on date so at the end i would like to say a happy patient is all that matters here we can see that she has undergone two laparoscopic surgery but still she looks fine so this was the culprit gall bladder and that shows the go back to the slide uh, the whole segment of the uh, common bile duct which was excised uh, with into this uh, mirizi uh, which was uh, pulled up by the surgeon and he divided both ends so this was the gall bladder that we had recovered from the a uh, patient which was which was found hanging we told him not to do anything further leave it there and uh, we had told him to remove the stent because the stent was free floating and it would have um, it got misplaced uh, within so he removed the endobiliary stent but the gall bladder was left in situ and uh, uh, yeah so go on piyush so now the question arises in our mind what an experienced surgeon would have done in this case so one option as discussed earlier was straight away single stage lap cholecystectomy with lap cbd exploration then the other thing is that when after ercp lap cholecystectomy was planned some anticipation of difficult cholecystectomy would have been done and then a subtotal cholecystectomy by opening the gall bladder and removing the stone would have prevented the bile duct injury what's the take of the panel on this well uh, from my side i say yeah i would have done subtotal cholecystectomy but most important is recognize the recognize the anatomy i wouldn't have gone into porto x y z uh, obviously you know uh, subtotal cholecystectomy itself is a, 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 another case based discussion for this forum uh, uh, and i recall one doing just last week uh, extra mucosal uh, subtotal cholecystectomy but that's something which i'm sure uh, any young surgeon whether Uh, in UK or outside requires understanding when to do. Um, uh, so uh, actually, we are presenting in our seventh uh, uh, robotic and laparoscopic symposium, first of October. Uh, I would send uh, the link to uh, via Bindu to all IAGS member. Please log in virtually, and uh, Professor Popper is also just speaking on uh, the erratic part of it. So uh, you'll hear subtotal, but certainly I would not consider the first option. I would go for subtotal for cystectomy. here at our center we have uh, one of the largest experience of uh, nearly 450 plus single stage lap cholecystectomy with lap cbd exploration and uh, with the with the first ercp i think that is what we would have done at the first instance uh, yes. but uh, yes of course as you rightly said subtotal is a absolute viable option so piyush you can just go on and finish the presentation just to add just to, in spite of having a cbd stent still patient can uh, Undergo a problem like this a CBD, I mean injury, something I mean unusual, but it can happen. This is because the shrunken gallbladder sometimes in a post ERCP uh, periductal and also calyx triangle inflammation 
can give a very challenging don't take it lightly even i will be uh, saying if it is an elderly patient you could have left the patient with a gall bladder for the rest of her life that is the hindsight we say i think dr parker wants to say something yeah it's just a, a minor thing but uh, over the years i've had like all of you have had problems like this and when they come you think oh god why me but one of the operations which people often forget which can get you out of a lot of trouble in this situation is a cholecystostomy and yes. i've done that on several occasions you just put the biggest tube in the world in into the gallbladder and bring it out straight in a straight line up to the abdominal wall leave it for six or eight or ten weeks doesn't matter how long but you have control in that situation you gain control obviously when you got to the point where the cbd's torn in half you that's a different situation although even then i might have just shoved a big drain into the cbd and brought it out to get things under control and to let things settle down but a, a cholecystostomy this is mostly for the junior people watching it's a really good operation. It gives you time. And the extraordinary thing is, and Professor Lau will know this, among many of you will, when you go back, it's remarkable how pristine everything looks sometimes. You go back and you think, well, nothing's happened. No, nobody's been here. It's absolutely beautiful to operate on. So it's just a, a little get you out of jail card, which is well worth remembering. Thank you very much, Prof, for yeah. that. Uh, Dr. Parker, I, actually... I, will, I would like to come in here, uh, Dr. Bandar Lala. I think Dr. Parker has a very valid point, which has also been explained in Tokyo guidelines that transhepatic percutaneous cholecystostomy is the way to go when you anticipate very difficult gallbladders. And incidentally, in the history of cholecystectomy, if you go, cholecystostomy was the first operation that was described for treatment of gallstones. Still, Carl Langenberg came into picture and did the first cholecystectomy. Till then, it was only cholecystostomy with a mucous fistula. What was the treatment of gallstones? So I think I agree with Dr. Parker. If at all somebody is in difficulty, cholecystostomy is the one to go through. If at all, one cannot uh, prevent a common bile injury. The last thing I would like to say, 10 seconds. Laparoscopic biliary injury, mm -hmm. the surgeon, as well as the patient does not anticipate it, is not prepared for it. And if it occurs, the patient becomes a cripple. That's all I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalvi. And uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, uh, Parker, for that uh, comment on uh, the uh, use of uh, cholecystostomy. We use it very often and we go back inside six to eight weeks later. And you, as you rightly said, it looks absolutely pristine. And yeah. you find all the adhesions gone and the Callos uh, become such uh, absolute, it's a completely different case. Yeah. yeah. Can I make one comment, Paulinda? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. In this patient, fortunately, uh, uh, went to your center and it would handle it laparoscopically, a complication. But for any other surgeon, I would have thought with that kind of bilirid injury, a open hepaticogesnostomy would have been possibly better because then possibly, I don't know whether the laparoscopic involvement led to that bleeding or pseudoaneurysm or whatever, but it's okay, you could handle it there, but any other surgeon in any other center, I would have thought a open hepaticogesis could have been better in the first place. Yeah, that's the point. Uh, uh, so that would be the option with many centers uh, who would not be having... Uh, you know, the experience, but because we handle a lot of that laparoscopically, of course, yeah. uh, we did it that route. But interestingly, the complications were all away from the site of the surgeries that we had performed. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, you know, it the complications happened at the lower end of the common bile duct from where the bleeding took place. And then the upper end of the duct where there was uh, charring and they developed, uh, you know, pseudoaneurysm of the hepatic artery. So, Piyush, just uh, finish your presentation in the last two slides. So, and wants to say something. Yes, uh, Mr. Tanner Lomblom is uh, raising his hand. Would you please come in quickly? Quick word regarding this case. Uh, I, I think everyone said uh, uh, um, what I wanted to say. I just wanted to reiterate what Professor Parker said. Uh, we've got an amazing opportunity to discuss these cases and, and disseminate knowledge. I happened to be lucky when I first started working in Colchester. I had a case like this and, and I did uh, 
uh, a cholecystostomy and got out of trouble. And, and that's what I've done for the last 18 years or so. So I think it's important uh, never to rush these things. And I think that's one of the most important things. Just buy, the, buy yourself some time and just think it through. Thank you. Thank you, Tan. Uh, very well said. Uh, Piyush, please uh, conclude the presentation. Go on to the last slide. We have two minutes. Piyush, uh, you can conclude the presentation. And uh, we His have connection is lost. Dr. Is LP Tangavelu, please come in as a final comments, uh, being one of the moderator. Uh, and <laughs> it, it was a fantastic, uh, uh, very, you know, nightmare to the patient as well as uh, to the surgeon. Only uh, in tertiary care center, uh, where uh, persons uh, with uh, high volume experience like uh, Professor Pavaninder Lal, only you know uh, can venture all these things. The basic point, what was uh, taught to all the young surgeons, when you uh, when you are trying to do a cholecystectomy. The critical view of safety should be established. If it is not possible, then the other two options, either cholecystostomy or subtotal cholecystectomy, the third option is you can refer the patient to uh, uh, IS center without much damage. That is the take home message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Tangavelu. Uh, Piyush is back, I think. So just yeah. conclude and con conclude your presentation, Piyush. Yeah. So we need close monitoring of the patient. And first repair is always the best chance to correct the biliary injury. And we should use the technology and appropriate investigation to help our patient. With this slide, I will conclude and I would like to thank IAGS and ALSGBI to give me this wonderful opportunity to present my case in such a wonderful platform. Thank you. Thank you. Can I come in, Dr. Pavaninder? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. So sure. I think uh, you, you managed the patient nicely in the end and the patient went home without any open surgery. I would have also done uh, lap poly with lap body exploration in the first place. But these things were not uh, anybody's hand because patient went to a, a surgeon in periphery and uh, unfortunately had uh, the biliary injury. But uh, the bleeding played important role in delaying the recovery. And uh, I think uh, one point to remember here is the, the bleeding and the injury to the right hepatic artery was from the primary lap coli part uh, where excessive yeah. cautery was used and the right hepatic artery was partially burnt out and led to uh, pseudo adenism and then bled profusely. Another thing is uh, whenever we are operating on a patient who has been operated by another surgeon, we need to see everything. So you nicely did a hepatico jejunostomy, but it is difficult to understand why the stitches were taken at the lower end of the bile duct. And so one must has to explore and see that what was done there, and if possible, ask the previous surgeon. But uh, obviously, in the given situation, uh, you and your team managed the patient nicely, and the uh, patient survived uh, very well. My compliments, and uh, very interesting case. Uh, and with this, uh, I think uh, uh, more than 500 uh, uh, surgeons attended today's program, and it's a big achievement for both IAGS and ALS GBI to come out with such an interesting program. And both the cases and both the keynote addresses were wonderfully planned and executed. And uh, I hope that uh, our journey of uh, combined education and academics and fellowship will continue for a long way of time. And uh, this is the way we learn from each other and we share our knowledge and uh, skills. Uh, so thank you uh, for this opportunity and thank you for all of you being here on this platform. Uh, over to you, Ishwar. Neil, can I chip in here? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, see, vasobiliary anast uh, uh, anatomy in the biliary tract is a challenge to any surgeon. Let's let's remember that number one. Number two, what affects biliary system also affects the adjoining vessel system. That has to be remembered by the surgeons all the time. When it comes to a secondary look at uh, any given procedure, if at all it has been unsuccessful biliary surgery, there has to be a vascular component forcing the surgeon to do something. So extensive investigation to study the biliary and vascular system before one goes in is extremely important. And whenever it's a biliary injury, there is enough time to investigate these patients from vascular injury point of view. And that is where the crux of the situation remains. I am. I have to congratulate Pavin Lalal for doing an excellent job, but this patient will have to be followed up because there has been a vascular injury and this patient is likely to follow up with a hepatic or jejunostomy stricture. So all the best to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful thoughts and uh, congratulations to Kondindral also, Piyu Sakharwal for bringing a very interactive and uh, interesting case discussion to keep in this historic collaborative webinar. Well done. And our certificate of appreciation goes to Piyu's. And let's coming to the final. Every good things come to a nice end. Now we have uh, the honorary treasurer, ALS GBI, and also the consultant surgeon from Colchester City, uh, Dan Erlomblom. He is going to be with us to give a of thanks on behalf of ALS GBI. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Iswa. Um, I'm uh, amazed that we have had 500 people uh, attend this seminar. It feels so intimate and I, I have uh, the, the huge honour of giving this vote of thanks. So uh, President, distinguished past presidents, uh, members of IAGES and ALS GBI, I would like to thank you most importantly for your participation. The collaboration between IAGES and ALS GBI will take on its own life whatever I want, whatever each individual wants, but it depends on a community of learners. And we were very, very lucky to have uh, Professor Udwadia and Professor Parker give of their knowledge uh, from the, the, the real climbing at the foothills of laparoscopic surgery. And that's important to know this history. Um, uh, Professor Parker, uh, showed some of the, the UK side of things. And of course, Professor Udwadia uh, gave a really erudite uh, uh, explanation of what was happening at the other side of the world. And we must be uh, mindful of this. And I'm truly inspired uh, by both of these surgeons. I have been following Professor Parker, who has been uh, a, a, a real inspiration and a guide uh, for me in terms of not only his technical skill, but also his uh, organization and management of, of, of situations and moving surgery forward. I think a special vote of thanks has to go to the presenters because without those case histories, um, we would not have the amazing discussion that we have had. And they have supercharged this meeting. Uh, it cannot go, be understated uh, both uh, the presenters were excellent, so you must take heart from that, and uh, I think we should all give a little round of applause wherever we are in the world. So I'm going to finish by saying that the quality of the debate and the different opinions on the care of these patients can only make things better. And what we have demonstrated is there is educational value and a currency of our common language of surgery. And we must keep this going. So I'd like to say thank you very much. It's been a fantastic evening and I'm really looking forward to the next uh, uh, set of webinars and also uh, other educational events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tan, for your wonderful, very encouraging words of wisdom, trying to bring both IAGS, ALSB, more frequently in this academic platform. Thanks to our Professor Sunil Puppet. 
I just want to, on behalf of our president and the executive committee members, in addition to our all online activities now with the COVID now slowly settling in, in our country, we are restarting our on-site physical events to start with. Next week, we are traveling for three days with the, the fellowship, the basic fellowships in laparoscopy and endoscopy with the first time in India with the cadaver endoscopy training. So people interested trainees, please come to Sri Ramchandra Medical College to be with us with the 30 faculties across the country will teach you the art and science of laparoscopy and endoscopy. If time permits, the next month, October, also equally busy with the colorectal course in Gem Hospital in Chennai by Praveen Raj and the subsequent months in uh, Kanyakumari, far south in our South India, uh, Siva Kumar is going to have the advanced laparoscopy course in hernia. And also members of IAGS, you can be proud if you can motivate your postgraduates if they've done a good thesis, especially I want Pavanindra Lal and all the postgraduates and Abed Alvisa to spread the message that the academic initiatives like postgraduate thesis award for all the postgraduates of surgery and also the IAGS members can apply for this best researchers award. The award, they are all applications are open till the end of September. And end of November. We, yeah, end of November, sorry. And we all look forward on behalf of uh, uh, Professor Sunil Puppet, our president-elect, and all the EC members, all the ALS GBA members to come in a big number to, for a physical conference. And like what we had in Gauhati, I'm sure Tan and others will enjoy the hospitality of Indian scenery. So we'll have a better and a bigger event in Rajamundri, a nice place in Andhra Pradesh with the Gandhi Pastor Rao as organizing chairman. So till that time, until we meet again, bye-bye from India. And thank you, ALSG, by having joined. And thank you, President, for bringing this, I mean, conceptualizing this and making it a real successful program. Thank you. Jai Hind. Ishwar, can I say one thing before we yeah, finish? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, just want to put it out to all the uh, members listening that our ALS GBI conference is happening in London on the 6th and 7th of December. And we would love for you to submit abstracts in the normal way uh, to this meeting. Uh, so if, if you are, have some work which you want to discuss, please submit the abstract. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, you very much, everybody. And on behalf of all of you here, I think we need to put our record and appreciation to Medinet with the Bindu and the Gautam Venkatesan and also Surendra and the team Medinet for a seamless transmission, making it a very successful first event between both associations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Goodbye.